Welcome to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast, hosted by the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association. We provide you with up-to-date information on health topics geared towards the Orthodox Jewish community. This podcast content is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as medical advice or as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician. Everyone deserves to be safe. The LEAVE initiative provides mental health support to those impacted by intimate partner violence, also known as domestic violence. We take a holistic approach to help survivors of any age find ways to heal and thrive. Our virtual and in-person services include crisis and individual counseling sessions, support groups, psychotherapy, community sense of emergency housing, and linkages to a variety of community resources. The LEAVE initiative is brought to the community by the Jewish Board in partnership with UJA Federation. For more information, contact us confidentially at lave at jbfcs.org. That's L-E-V at jbfcs.org or 646-273-1800. Welcome to the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association, or JOMA, podcast. I'm your host, Elisa Minkin. I'm a general pediatrician and proud JOMA member. And today I'm really, really honored and really, really excited to be interviewing Dr. Robert Marion. If there are topics you wanna hear, comments on this podcast, other podcasts, um, you wanna be interviewed, you know someone you wanna hear being interviewed, please reach out to us at health at joma.org, H-E-A-L-T-H at joma.org. I'll also say that I'm going to be linking in the show notes some other podcasts, including the ones I've done related to this topic and some that I've listened to recently related to this topic, because it is so vast that we could not possibly have covered it all. Um, If you don't have access to the show notes, you can always reach out to us at health at joma.org for the links. Dr. Robert Marion, professor of pediatrics and obstetrics and gynecology and Women's Health at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine is Chief Emeritus of the Divisions of Pediatric Genetic Medicine and of Development Medicine at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore and Director Emeritus of Einstein's Rose F. Kennedy University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities and of its Children's Evaluation and Rehabilitation Center. From 1987 through 2010, he also served as Director of Genetics at Blythedale Children's Hospital in Valhalla, New York. He has taught at the Joan H. Marks Graduate Program at Sarah Lawrence College since 1980, and has served the program in multiple roles, including as a member of its admissions committee. A 1979 graduate of Einstein, Dr. Marion did his internship in pediatrics at Tufts Medical Center in Boston, then returned to Einstein for his residency and fellowship in medical genetics at Einstein Affiliated Hospitals. He has been a faculty member at Einstein since 1984. He has been co-chair of Einstein's Committee on Admissions since 1990. His clinical and research interests include the natural history and genetic basis of multiple malformation syndromes. At Blythedale, he served as medical director of the Einstein Montefiore Spina Bifida Clinic for 25 years. He is a founder and director or co-director of Montefiore's Regional Williams Syndrome Center, Cardiogenetics Clinic, Immunogenetics Clinic, and Dermatology Genetics Clinic. He has published extensively in the medical literature in these areas, and in addition, is the author of seven books, including The Intern Blues, The Boy Who Felt No Pain, winner of a Christopher Award, Learning to Play God, and Genetics Round, A Doctor's Life in the Field That Revolutionized Medicine. He is the recipient of Einstein's Samuel Rosen Award for Excellence in Medical Student Teaching, selected by the medical students, and the Alumni Association's Lifetime Service Award. He is also the winner of the Lewis Frad Award for Residency Education and the Obrinsky Award for Excellence in Medical Student Teaching in the Department of Pediatrics. In May 2015, he received the Exceptional Commitment to Teaching Award from the Joan H. Marks Graduate Program in Human Genetics at Sarah Lawrence. In May 2016, he was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award for Teaching from Einstein. And this is an incredible honor. Um, I am a big fan of, of Dr. Marion's books, and I heard him speak at a grand rounds for my pediatric practices that I'm in, actually on his cardiogenetics clinic. And I reached out to him and he graciously accepted um, to be interviewed by me. So I'm really, really excited to um, have the honor of this interview. Welcome, Dr. Marion. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh my gosh, I am the most excited, okay? Because I'm a big fan of your books. And, you know, I've, I've told my listeners that I, I do have a daughter with disabilities and there's been a 
a diagnostic odyssey component that I'm not going to go into for her privacy, um, but this is this is both personal and, and really an honor and very exciting for me. And I have to tell you, we, we are pretty much from the same era. We're kind of what I call from the Smith's textbook era and the karyotype uh -huh. era of genetics. And so I, I would love, you have the bird's eye view. I would love for you to take us through how things have changed and where we are. All in so, one podcast. <laughs> okay, well, so first of all, I have to tell you that Smith is my probably my favorite book in the world. When I was a, a medical student and a resident, I was a very weird medical student and resident. I kept it on my uh, bedside table and every night I would read a different syndrome um, and memorize it so that by the end of my residency, I had basically memorized all of Smith's recognizable patterns of human malformations. This is a book that um, has about covers about 300 to 400 different rare syndromes um, that that um, a geneticist had to identify on the basis of the features that he or she saw in a patient. A kid would come in. Um, we would see kind of puffiness around the eyes and puffiness around the mouth and kind of what's described as an elfin-like facies. We would see that the kid was short and very personable, very outgoing, and, we, and, and had a history of heart disease. And we would put these features together as this kid must have Williams syndrome. Um, in those days, there was very little testing available. So our clinical impression was the thing that drove us. Um, but as time passed, that changed. I should say, and I'm sorry I'm talking so much, but there's so much to tell you. No, no, no. <laughs> this, is, this is what I have you on for. You're doing great. Yeah. Smith's Recognizable Patterns of Malformations mm -hmm. um, has a series of photographs in it that we all kind of memorize. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, what you were referring mm -hmm. to. I still have my copy. Mm -hmm. Right. And I have, I have every edition that's come out through history uh, on my bookshelf back there. But, um, but ha the pictures in the book are terrible. The pictures are, um, uh, you know, they don't show the patients, the children usually in the best light. Mm -hmm. Why is that? It's because the pictures were taken by clinical geneticists who had absolutely no training in photography. So I, my mentor uh, uh, had a Instamatic, a Kodak Instamatic camera, which he kept with him on his desk and um, it had a chain attached to it, which was like two feet long. And the chain was to show him how far away from the pic from the kid the um, the pic the camera should be, so he could get the best picture. <clears throat> but you know, it it they were just terrible pictures. Um, it, this was all pointed out to us a couple of years ago by a guy named Rick Goidati, a fashion photographer very well known, who realized that people with genetic diseases like uh, ocular cutaneous albinism could, were actually beautiful and could be photographed in a way that made them look wonderful. And so slowly over time, those terrible pictures in Smith's Recognizable Patterns of Human Malformations and all the other textbook of genetics over the years are being replaced by these much nicer photographs of people, um, it, it's certainly more respectful of the of the families and of the, mm. the person. Um, I could go on and on about this. I could fill a whole hour with just the stories of taking pictures, but I won't do that. <laughs> I, I'm gonna say one thing though, um, Dr. Yeah. Rafatarshi, who I interviewed and, and you listened to it, um, uh -huh. told me about a project, a photography project, and I have to go look it up and maybe link it in the show notes. That yeah, is that's, also, that, is that the same person? Yeah. Yes, that's Rick Goddotti's uh, project, uh, Positive Exposures, it's called. Um, yeah. And he has a museum in New York, actually, where um, he shows a lot of these uh, photographs of people with um, rare diseases. An another problem is that we're taking pictures of children. If, if we, um, if we, you know, the pictures in Smith, and if I want to give a lecture, back in the old days, if I wanted to give a lecture, on Williams syndrome, um, I had to find a patient with Williams syndrome and get permission to take his or her picture. We shouldn't be taking pictures of two or three year old kids or you know kids right. under 18 without their permission. 
Um, we're asking the parents to give us permission, but that's not really fair to the child who should have a say in whether or not his facial, his or her facial appearance is shown to a group of medical students or residents or attending physicians um, really without his, his or her say so. So uh, there are all sorts of problems that just come up from taking pictures. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that the biggest advance in academic genetics has been uh, two things, PowerPoint, <laughs> because <laughs> in the old days, making slides was a pain in the neck, right. and, um, and the internet, because now if I need a picture of a child with Williams syndrome, as, again, for instance, I can, I can just Google uh, uh, Williams syndrome and a picture will come up and I'll be able to use that picture because it's already uh, the Approved. person has been given approval. Yeah. So, so that's made life a lot easier than forcing us to carry around cameras in case we encounter a kid with a rare disease that we need to uh, complete our collection, say. So basically, Smith's was a way for us to look at a child and identify um, features that pointed to a specific diagnosis. And that's how we operated for years and years. But yeah. I, I, I want to have you define phenotype versus genotype. Now, okay. Here's my, here's okay. my moment. <laughs> okay. So phenotype is um, the physical findings that you find in an individual who has a condition. So a child with Williams syndrome, the phenotype is the child has a characteristic facial appearance, which has been described as elfin-like. The child is short, has a has a short stature and is not growing as well. There's an underlying congenital heart disease, uh, most likely supervalvular aortic stenosis. There's some developmental disability, but this really um, very hypersocial, outgoing personality, which is described as a cocktail party personality. So that's the phenotype of Williams syndrome. Those features are caused by a deletion in chromosome seven. So there's a segment in chromosome seven that's missing one in one copy of chromosome seven that's missing in kids with Williams syndrome. That's the genotype of Williams syndrome. So the genotype is the genetic basis for the phenotype, the physical findings. We don't understand why this deletion in chromosome seven leads to the physical findings that we see in kids with Williams syndrome. But we know that that's the case, that if you see the phenotype in Williams syndrome, you do the testing and you find the genotype, the deletion in chromosome seven. Right. That's so how it used to work. Mm -hmm. the, but the obvious question here is, does the phenotype always match the genotype? The genotype doesn't always match the, pho the phenotype. Um, and that you know causes more uh, problems um, in trying to make a diagnosis. So a good example of that, if you want me to tell you examples of this, is mm -hmm, sure. a condition called Stickler syndrome. Stickler syndrome is an autosomal dominantly inherited disorder, and we'll talk about what that means. But that basically means that if a, if a, a parent has this condition, um, he or she can pass it on to each of his or her children, and each child of that parent would have a 50% chance of having the condition and a 50% chance of not having the condition. But not everybody who carries a specific gene will be affected with the condition, will have any of the features of the condition. That's a, a concept called um, um, penetrance. Penetrance. <laughs> so <laughs> genes that are 100% penetrant, everybody who has the change in the gene mm -hmm. winds up with the physical findings. Um, a, but many genes have decreased penetrance. Um, the, so, so not everybody who carries the gene will have the features of it. At the same time, some people are more severely affected and some people are less severely affected. Um, that's uh, penetrance and <laughs> blocking. Spectrum, spectrum, maybe? No, I know. there's no. a term, so, I don't know what it is either. Uh, variability, mm -hmm. so, it's, uh, so, it's, so it's like uh, the light is turned on or it's turned off, that's penetrance. Mm -hmm. um, the, if you have a dimmer on the light, dimmer. 
Mm. Uh, that's variability. Mm. So you have more severe or brighter or less severe or or darker, you know, it, it, to use that as an example. So in Stickler syndrome, we'll see babies who have a cleft palate, a small jaw, and breathing problems. That's a condition called Pierre Aubin malformation sy syndrome. It's a life-threatening condition. So these kids come to attention right away in the newborn period. But frequently, we'll step back and look at the family and find that one of the parents has severe myopia, very nearsighted, wearing really thick gla glasses. And that person's mother or father has early onset of, of uh, um, arthritis. So all of those features are features that we see in, in Stickler syndrome. They're caused by a change in the same gene. They're passed on from parent to child, but not everybody who carries that gene will have similar uh, symptoms. So that's variability of expression um, and um, in a, you know and so you get very, so you get uh, everybody has the same gene, but the phenotype is different. Right. I'm also thinking that when you were in the era of the Smiths, it really depended on the experience. It depended on the whether it was dialed all the way up, you know, in the more right. extreme and you think you would just get more of the tip of the iceberg and there's subjectivity. Right, exactly. So you needed to know what to look for. You needed to be trained in figuring out what other features are associated with this finding of um, of Pierre Aubin malformation sequence, uh, the small jaw, the U-shaped cleft palate, and the breathing problems. Um, what other conditions to look for in other family members? And not everybody was aware of, of those things and, and knew to, to ask about it. So in those days, genetics, uh, clinical genetics was really an art. Mm -hmm. um, it was a matter of uh, uh, examining a patient, taking the history and hearing what was going on in the child's life, in the family's history, and then trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together to make a diagnosis. And then based on that diagnosis, we would do some genetic testing. We might do, as you said, a karyotype, which is uh, um, looking at the chromosomes, <clears throat> um, uh, there should be 46 chromosomes. There, there may be small pieces missing. There may be extra pieces available. Um, uh, if they were large enough, the karyotype, the testing that was available in the 60s, 70s, and 80s could pick that up. But a lot of times it, our, our testing was not sensitive, sensitive enough to pick that up. Um, uh, occasionally, there were single genes that we could test. So, for instance, uh, Stickler syndrome is caused by um, a change in a gene that codes for collagen. Um, so you could, you know, there were labs that would test for the specific collagen defect that occurred in this condition, and you could send testing away. But, but the base, basis behind this was you had to have an idea in your head what you were testing for. Um, and then do the testing. A and that would confirm your diagnosis. Uh, and a lot of times, as we've said, there, weren't, there was no testing. The diagnosis was made just on the basis of the clinical impression. Um, that was the old days. As time has passed and, and technology has advanced, uh, the Human Genome Project was completed. We had the entire sequence of the human genome. That was a um, a study that cost about three billion dollars. So it that's kind of an expensive lab test to do on, mm. on people. But as time has passed, the technology has gotten better and better. So that um, in about 2014, we were able to do what's called whole exome sequencing. And now, uh, more recently in the last year or two, we're now able to do whole genome sequencing. And I'll explain the difference between those two. So the, the genome, the human genome is made up of 3 billion bases. That's, I, I just can't, I, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to visualize what that means. But in every cell of your body, you carry DNA that's composed of these bases, the building blocks of DNA, 
And there are 3 billion of them in every cell of your body. Um, so sequencing all 3 billion has been until recently above and beyond our capabilities to offer as a routine genetic test to a, to a child or to a family. So the thinking was that, well, most of the information, I should tell you that, that of those 3 billion bases, one to 2% um, of, the, of the DNA in, in those 3 billion bases um, codes for specific genes or, or you know, are part of specific genes. And those genes encode proteins. So the genes are the instructions that tell the cells of the body to make a specific protein. And it's the protein that carries out the work of the, of the gene, right? Mm -hmm. So our, our bodies are composed of, each of cells of our bodies are composed of 20,000 or so genes. Um, and those genes make up only about one to 2% of all of the bases. So 98% of the bases that compose the DNA, is this making any sense? No, this is perfect, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the term junk DNA at this point, and what is right. the other 98%? That's what I'm getting to. Okay, so good. you're doing great. <laughs> the, the 98% that's, that doesn't code for, for specific genes has been called junk DNA. Mm -hmm. Is it junk DNA? Is it just junk? No, mm -hmm. it's not junk. It's the it's the um, owner's manual. It's the guide to the cell that tells how the genes should be expressed. So backing up a, a minute, there are 20,000 genes that, um, that are in our genomes. They code for everything that makes us what we are. You know, they code for proteins, they code for enzymes that break down substances that keep us healthy. Um, they, uh, there are, there are genes that um, tell other genes how to express themselves. Basically, uh, we have 20,000 genes, but not every gene is expressed in every cell of the body. So for instance, your hemoglobin is made up of, um, of two components, heme and, and globin. The globin genes, uh, there's an alpha globin gene and a beta globin gene. Those are expressed in, in your blood cells. They're not expressed in your brain. They're not expressed in your liver. Well, except in some situations, mm -hmm. but they're expressed only in blood cells. How, does the ce how do the blood cells know to express those genes while the brain cells know not to express those genes? If the brain expressed the globin genes, it would be complete chaos and and um, we would not be able to function. We don't know exactly the answer to that, but the belief is that the instructions to, for genes to be, ex where genes should be expressed and where they should not be expressed are contained in that junk DNA. So it's a lot of stuff. We don't understand it. It's been called junk DNA, but it's definitely not junk. However, back to what happened in about 2014, the thinking was, well, we can't sequence all three, all three, three billion bases. Let's focus on the, the DNA that codes for um, these genes, uh, that, that make up these genes that code for these proteins, because the likelihood is that human disease is more likely to occur in genes that in the genes than they are in the junk DNA. So um, this is kind of a shortcut that was used, and it was pretty effective. We could identify between twenty percent and forty or fifty percent of, of of cases of disease by looking at the um, at the uh, the exomes. Mm. But there were still a lot left who were not. Doing, DNA, doing a whole genome sequencing, that is sequencing all or most of the 3 billion bases, should get us to a point where we have a much higher yield. So, but wait a second. First of all, I'm going to say that first part was whole exome sequencing, just to make it really clear. Yeah. And now you're talking about whole genome sequencing. Why wouldn't that give us everything? 
Well, because that's looking, uh, you know, it's like looking for your keys if you lose them on a dark night. Mm. You're going to look under the lights because that's where it's, you're more likely to find them. In the dark areas, you can't find the, gene, the, the keys, so you, you're not going to really look there. That's the, if you think of the light areas, the under the lights, that's the exome mm -hmm. sequencing. If you look at the dark areas and the light areas, that's genome sequencing, right? Does that make well, sense? Well, but wouldn't you be turning the light everywhere then? Why is it right. dark so if you're, you're looking at all of it? So you're, so you're basically turning the light. the light on everywhere. That's a good way of, of looking at it. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a much higher, it should be a much higher yield to do that. We should be able to identify everything that we couldn't identify before. But here's what's happened. Because we now don't have to identify what we're looking for. So in other words, we don't have to say, I think this kid has Williams syndrome, let's do this test. Or I think this kid has, has um, um, XYZ syndrome, let's do genetic testing for that condition. We can now just send a sample of blood or even a saliva sample to the lab. They'll do whole exome sequencing or more recently whole genome sequencing, and they'll report back to us, we found in this sample a deletion in chromosome seven. This child must have Williams syndrome. So again, what's happening is we don't need to tell the lab what we're looking for. Mm. They'll tell us what they found and we'll try to fit the features that we see in a kid um, into the findings that the lab uh, reported out to us. So no longer do we need to have that expertise in saying, oh, this, this is probably Stickler syndrome because this kid has Piero bad malformation sequence, his father has high myopia, and his grandmother has early onset of uh, arthritis. They'll tell us that the kid has a change in that collagen gene that's consistent with Stickler syndrome. We'll then turn to the parents and say, oh, one of you must have this, and, and you have high myopia, you must have Stickler syndrome as well, and your mother must have Stickler syndrome too. So it's turned everything on its head. And this more and more is happening in, in medicine and in genetics. But what I'm thinking though, is that when you're looking that broadly, when you're floodlighting the entire genome, you're gonna find more than just one thing. You're gonna find a lot of keys, right? So, so obviously, yes. yes. So, so it's, you know, all of us have multiple changes in our DNA. Um, and this is just natural. This is, this is what happens with DNA. Um, um, the variation in the DNA is what causes us all to look and act the way we do. So, you know, some people have blonde hair and some people have dark hair. Some people have blue eyes and some people have brown eyes. All of those are variations, are caused by variations in the DNA, um, which, um, which you know, are, are private to your person, to, to you as a person. If we do all the DNA analysis, we'll pick up those changes. But finding changes in the DNA, sometimes it's helpful in making a diagnosis, but a lot of times is giving us information that we don't necessarily want and we don't necessarily need. So it raises all sorts of ethical issues that need to be um, investigated. And what happens in genetics is that over time, the technology runs way ahead of the ethics. So we're able to do things. The question is, um, should we be doing those things? Should be, we be reporting out um, genetic uh, variations in an individual that may affect him or her later in life, but has no bearing on who he is now, um, or should those remain secret? Um, sounds suspicious, but it sounds like big, yeah, yeah. big brother, big brother, but, yeah, yeah, but um, so who decides, that, yeah, and who should decide that? Um, should the family decide it? 
uh, should the kid decide it, but a two-year-old kid or a, a newborn baby will not have the ability to decide whether or not he or she wants to hear this information. Should the lab decide it? They have no stake in what happens to the kid. Should the clinician decide it? Um, it's a real problem, and it's, we don't really have problem. a problem. And we don't have a great answer for it. Right. I'm thinking we were worried before about the pictures. This is a huge, yeah. huge worry. Right. And it's also oh, privacy yeah. as well. There's issues of privacy, just the pictures of the genetic privacy. Right. And and there are there are questions of who should be able to access that information right. once it's available. Should that should should researchers be able to tell who has a change in a specific gene so that they can do their research projects involving a larger group of people? Should insurance companies get that information? Should um, your employer get that information? You know, how should that be protected and who protects it? And those are huge questions. Um, and the answers are different depending on what kind of testing you get. Yeah, I want to go through the testing, but I want you to give a few explanations before we go into that, because this information that we're getting is so detailed, um, I think we need to explain um, a couple of terms I have down here. Polymorphism, um, single nucleotide, SNP, what does that stand for? Uh, polymorphism. polymorphism, single nucleotide polymorphism. And variant of un unknown significance, because that's going to come up with this test. Okay, okay, so, so um, um, the first of those terms, polymorphisms, is just a, in, when it pertains to genetics, is a change in in the DNA um, that may or may not be associated with disease, but is is there and is a present, uh, identifiable, findable. So um, what this means is, you know, again, there are three billion bases that make up the our DNA. Um, you can imagine that even if there's a one in ten thousand chance of a change occurring you're gonna have a lot of changes in your DNA that other people may or may not have. Of course, these are inherited and they're inherited from your parents and they're inherited by your parents from their parents and on and on and on. So there are certain polymorphisms that are identifiable in people who come from a specific background. And so what I mean by that is that, here, think of it this way. So um, it, uh, think of, genes as houses in a kind of housing development like I grew up in in Rockland County um, and uh, so every house on my street looked exactly the same um, but some of them were red and some of them were blue and some of them were pink our house was pink um, let's say everybody who's who's um, who came from the town of Suwalki in Poland painted their house pink. So you could look up and down the street and say, oh, here's somebody who came from Suwalki. Here's somebody who came from Suwalki. But everybody who came from Odessa um, uh, has, a, has a blue house. So looking at the people who have blue houses, you can tell that this person is from Odessa, this person's from Odessa, this person's from... Uh, from uh, so, so that's really how... Um, how polymorphisms work, and you can use that to identify your your eth ethnic background, basically. Um, uh, a single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP, is um, just what that means. Uh, rather than a large sequence of DNA that's specific to one region, this is a single change in the DNA and so it's more specific. It gives you more information. So rather than saying pink houses, uh, people from Suwalki have pink houses. I'm, uh, my father came from Suwalki, so that's mm -hmm. why he's there. And we had a pink house. Rather than mm -hmm. saying, okay, that's they're all pink. But if you came from a specific neighborhood in Suwalki, you have um, a window sash that's red. Uh, so you can look up and down the street and say, oh, this is somebody who's from Suvalki, but they come from this neighborhood, whereas that's somebody who comes from a different neighborhood. So that's the concept of single nucleotide polymorphisms. It gives you more specificity um, in the variation that occurs. Uh, 
So changes in the DNA uh, can be benign. That is, they just cause um, a change from one base to another, but they can also be disease causing. So in other words, if the change in the DNA, if the polymorphism occurs in um, an encoding, an, a, a coding region in a gene, um, say the gene for, I don't know, for, for Gaucher disease, mm -hmm. um, if, if it occurs in that, um, in that coding region, Gaucher disease is a Jewish genetic disease, type one, um, which uh, causes a series of medical problems later in life. It's autosomal recessively inherited, which we'll talk about, I think. But if you have a, a change in the gene that causes that, that may affect the protein that's supposed to be produced. That's an enzyme um, that breaks down um, a complicated substance. Um, so if you have a change in the gene that leads to a change in the protein, that protein may not work as well, and it may cause you to have some symptoms um, either early in life or later on in life. So that's called a pathogenic variant, that is a variant that causes disease. Um, so there are benign variants that are just polymorphisms that don't really change anything in the, uh, in the amino acid sequence of a protein. At the other end of the spectrum, there are disease causing or pathogenic variants that alter the way the protein works and, and may cause disease. Between those two extremes, benign and, and uh, disease causing, is this wide gulf of of we don't know. There's a change, we found a change, it's gonna alter the DNA pattern um, of, the, of the gene, it's going to have some effect on the protein that results from the gene, but we don't know if that change is gonna cause disease or not. That's, the lab calls that a variant of uncertain significance or a VUS, a V-U-S. Oh, I didn't know how to uh, pronounce that. Yeah. <laughs> <VUS>. <laughs> and, and I, I always call it V-U-S, but, uh, right. but it's frequently called a VUS. And, um, and the problem is we don't know, it, it's hard to tell whether a VUS is, is responsible. So we're seeing a kid who has a condition um, we're seeing a family that has long QT syndrome, which is a, a cardiac rhythm problem that um, can lead to sudden death um, in, in an individual because their heart rhythm is disturbed. Um, and this is caused by a single gene mutation. Um, and uh, we see um, a change in one of the genes that's known to be associated with long QT syndrome. Well, so we're seeing this family where we know that this that something exists, this, this cardiac rhythm problem exists. We test the gene, the series of genes that are associated with this. We find that in one of them, there's a change in the gene. Well, obviously you would think that change in the gene is responsible for that person's heart rhythm disturbance and the sudden death of one of their relatives. But the fact is, it may just be true, true, unrelated. It may just be mm. a coincidence. So we have to do additional testing to try to figure out if that variant of uncertain significance that was found in the gene truly is pathogenic, is disease-causing, or if it's just um, a, a red herring. So there are ways that we can do that. And, and you, that's when you need a geneticist. That's when the geneticist kind of earns his or her living because um, they, we have to look at that and say, well, in this family, we know that this, uh, that the, this person's parent also has long QT syndrome. If we test that parent and that parent also carries the VUS that we found in our patient, then that will tell us that it's more likely that this is a disease-causing variant, not a variant of uncertain significance. Whereas if that parent doesn't carry this change in the gene and has long QT syndrome, then it probably is benign. So that's some of the steps that we take 
to identify whether a VUS is disease causing or not. But that really takes some understanding of um, who needs to be tested, who in the family is at risk, and, um, and how to go about doing that. We can also, in certain cases, and this is true in long QT syndrome, we can take, we can make the protein that comes from the gene that has the VUS in it and test it in the laboratory to see if it works or not um, in vitro. And that will tell us, that will give us a clue as to whether the, this VUS is, um, is disease causing or not. And I'm just thinking of this and I'm going to talk and talk and talk. So You're going to talk. I'm going to stop you for a second for a couple of things. Oh, okay, this good, is fantastic, good. though. I'm, I'm listening. I'm wrapped. Um, <laughs> first of all, when you talk about testing, I mean, it would be more definitive if you found out that that variant actually caused a protein change. But is that clinically done or is that like in research labs? Um, it's mostly in research labs, but it's, it's widely um, enough available. A lot of this stuff has already been published. So, you know, if you, you find a variant in a gene, that's only been seen in five or six people, but a lab has actually studied that that gene change in in the lab. You can get some information out of out of that information out of, out of that finding. So I'll give you an example, um, if I can. I, I don't mm -hmm. want to stop you from asking questions, but <clears throat> um, I have a patient who. Uh, was running, uh, was was riding his bicycle on a hot day um, in the summer. Um, he was in perfect health, uh, no problems at all. Um, he ate a big breakfast um, before he started riding. He didn't, he forgot his water bottle, so he wasn't drinking water. He rode for about five miles and fell to the ground dead. He was dead. It just so happened that a passing, um, a passing nurse from an ICU saw him fall to the yeah, it's just amazing, fall to the ground and um, and started resuscitation. Somebody else called an ambulance. He was taken to the hospital. He was fully re resuscitated. When he was recovered, um, he we did genetic testing and found that he had a variant of uncertain significance in a gene which is associated with this condition, long QT syndrome. So um, uh, we didn't know if this gene was responsible for, if this change in the gene was responsible for his uh, collapsing like that. So uh, one of my colleagues uh, studied the change in the gene in his lab and produced the protein that, was, um, that, that resulted from it and found that under normal circumstances, um, when everything was fine, um, the gene worked fine, the protein worked fine, but when he changed the environmental features, that is, he made the, um, the environment more acidotic, as would be the case in somebody's heart after they'd eaten a big breakfast and all of their blood was in their uh, gut, and they were a little bit dehydrated because it was hot and they hadn't been drinking water, the protein deformed and stopped working because of the acidosis. So under normal circumstances, this protein worked fine, but because of this perfect storm that this guy had created by what he had done while he was riding his bicycle, he, the protein deformed itself and wound up not working and he wound up having long, the effects of long QT syndrome which under normal circumstances he wouldn't have. So that's an important point because not every change in the gene will be effective under all circumstances. There are environmental factors that have to act on them also. So basically all diseases, virtually all diseases are an interplay between genetic background, you know, um, your, your polymorphisms, uh, whether they're disease causing or maybe not disease causing, and the environment in which those genes are being expressed. And this was an extreme ex example of that, but a really good example of it, I think. Yes. And I remember the rest of the story. Was the rest of the story about testing his child, I think? Yes. So that was, um, 
another problem, which was he had a son who was going off to college. And um, because his father had this condition, um, he had a 50-50 chance of having inherited it, inheriting it. Um, and some of the environmental factors that are involved in deforming this protein and causing the, and possibly causing the disease are, um, you know, exercise, obviously causing acidosis, but also certain drugs, um, uh, uh, dr drugs that may be used by an adolescent mm -hmm. um, and, and other factors as well. So the question is, um, this kid was 16 years old when we saw him. So he wasn't at an age where he could decide where he was likely to, well, he couldn't decide for himself. We had to get permission from his parents to test him for this. His parents said, oh, he's been through so much already um, with his father having this, this episode. His father was fine after, after he was resuscitated. Um, we don't think it's, we want to test him. We don't want to give him the burden of, of this as well. And we don't want to really tell him what um, what's at risk. So, I have to stop you just a minute, though, because yeah. I, I want to say when I heard the story, I was screaming inside because not all <laughs> genetic information is actionable. This is actionable. <laughs> yes, yes. But but also it's not so we couldn't re even talk with him about the testing. Right. We uh, because his parents forbade us forbade us from doing it. Um, and so, and he went off to college and I had in the back of my mind, the fact that I knew there was another um, woman, a, a woman who lived in Westchester County, uh, who had long QT syndrome type one, went off to college at um, Indiana University. Um, and uh, at the end of her sophomore year, uh, went out partying um, when finals were complete and um, disappeared. Nobody's seen her since. Um, and it's been 10 years now, and um, it's not clear what happened to her. I suspect that that she um, got into some drugs, um, uh, and she had a, um, a cardiac arrest and died. Her friends who were with her panicked, and they hit her body somewhere. So so here's somebody who knew that she had this condition and was at risk for it. Our patient, um, our patient's son didn't know, even right. know about it. What was going to happen to him when he went off um, to college um, and, you know, did what college kids do. Right. So this was a real concern to me for years and years. The, the, um, the end of the story is that uh, he recently was tested. Um, after all of this was explained, and he tested negative. Right, he was getting married, as I remember. <laughs> right, right. So <laughs> thank God, thank God for that. Yeah, That's a great so ending. Thank, thank God, but, <laughs> but you know, it's the kind of thing that keeps you awake at night, right. um, worrying about what's going to happen to to this kid. Um, and, and that was me. I'm just the the physician. Um, what are his parents thinking during this time? They right. must have worried. Uh, but they didn't want to bring it up with them. Yeah. I want to go back a minute because you mentioned you're going to define autosomal recessive. I'm presuming that particular change is autosomal dominant. You need just one. one. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So so the difference between autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive and X-linked recessive and X-linked dominant is that for autosomal, you know, the, a, a functional definition, autosomal dominant disorders, you only need one copy of, so you get two copies, you have two copies of every gene. You get one from your mother and one from your father at the time of conception. Um, for an autosomal dominant, to have an autosomal dominant disease, you need one, you need a change in one copy of the gene. So people who have autosomal dominant disorders have one copy of the gene that has a change in it that's pathogenic, that's disease causing, and another copy of the gene that's perfectly fine works just fine. Um, and so um, a child of a parent who carries an autosomal dominant trait um, has each child has a 50% chance of having inherited that and a 50% chance of getting the parent's other, uh, 
other gene that doesn't have a, a problem with it. Um, and that's, you know, not everybody who carries that gene will express it necessarily. So that's, again, decreased penetrance. Um, autosomal recessive disorders, in order to have the condition that you're worried about, say Tay-Sachs disease, you need to have two copies of the non-working gene. So a parent who is a carrier has one copy of the non-working gene and one copy of the working gene. When that parent makes sperm or egg, he or she can, can place in the sperm or egg either the working copy or the non-working copy. If, if, um, if a child is conceived using the sperm of a parent who's a carrier and the sperm carries the non-working gene and that fertilizes the egg of a mother who's a carrier and that egg carries also carries the non-working gene, that child will have two non-working genes and will therefore not have one working gene and will have the disorder that, um, that we're concerned about. Right, that, that's a really good explanation and that's the basis of carrier testing, right? That's the basis of carrier testing. And for the most part, not always, but for the most part, carriers, um, people who have one working copy and one non-working copy are fine. They don't have additional risk for any disease. In fact, there's some uh, feeling that in some cases, uh, being a carrier is actually protective. Mm -hmm. So the example that's always given is that in sickle cell disease, people who, are, who have sickle trait are protected against malaria. So in area, it, it, so the, this is always illustrated by the distribution of the sickle gene in the world mm -hmm. um, overlaid over a map of where malaria is common. And, and they kind of match up. And the reason for, for this, we think, is that people who are carriers of sickle trait, that is, have one copy of the sickle cell gene, the sickle cell mutation, and one copy uh, of normal beta globin, um, those people are protected against severe effects of malaria. They get malaria as frequently as other people, but as the malaria parasite begins to reproduce itself within the cells, the oxygen saturation in the cell drops and the, sick, and the person who has a sickle trait, um, the cell collapses, forms a sickle cell and the protozoan can't go through its normal life cycle. So they get infected the same rate as other people, but they don't get as sick. And so they have a selective advantage in the population, mm. meaning that they can survive where other people have died of malaria. So it's thought that in all the uh, more common autosomal recessive disorders, um, there is some selective advantage that's uh, available to carriers over the general population. But that hasn't been worked out for things like cystic fibrosis, which is the most common um, autosomal recessive disorder in the in the um, in the European population, mm. and and of course Tay Sachs, um, which is the best known right. but not the most common um, uh, uh, autosomal recessive disorder in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, uh, the most common uh, autosomal recessive disorder in the Ashkenazi Jewish population is is um, Gaucher disease. Uh, we don't hear as much about Gaucher disease because it's not as dramatically um, severe as, um, as Tay-Sachs, which, as everybody knows, causes, in most cases, causes disease within the first year of life with uh, babies who are affected with Tay-Sachs disease having a progressive neurodegenerative condition that leads to their death by the time they're usually by the time they're five or six years old. Uh, people with disease with the type that occurs in the Ashkenazi Jewish population are usually much more mildly affected, live into adulthood, may or may not have symptoms at, at times during their lives, 
but um, the carrier frequency of Gaucher in the Ashkenazi Jewish population is about one in 15. That's high. So it's really high. And unfortunately, we're finding that Gaucher carriers are don't have a selective advantage and mm. in fact are more prone to develop um, Parkinson's disease as wow. they get older. Yeah. So if you look at, at uh, Ashkenazi Jewish population with Parkinson's disease, five to 10% will have um, a variant in the gene that causes Gaucher disease, um, uh, which doesn't cause them any other problems, uh, but um, they are more likely to develop go, uh, uh, Parkinson's disease as they get older. Okay, so that's an example of information that yep. you know can be disturbing and not actionable, right? At least at this point. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, and and since Gaucher disease is usually itself is so mild, it raises all sorts of ethical issues about should we be should we be screening the Ashkenazi Jewish population for Gaucher um, because uh, you know the the reason for for doing Jewish genetic testing for the most part is to identify couples that are at risk to have a child who's affected with a disease that for which there's no treatment so that they can prevent they, they can be prevented from having children with those conditions um, but Gaucher can a, a significant percentage of people with Gaucher, with Gaucher, Gaucher disease have few or no symptoms and live into their you know 70s or 80s without any uh, severe disease. So should we be testing carriers for that condition in an attempt to prevent children with that condition from being born? Um, now we've added to that this question of, well, this could be a screen for telling who's likely to get a Parkinson's disease and who's not likely to get Parkinson's disease, but much later in life. So wait, I have a question. I'm sorry, what sure. what increased rate is it of the Parkinson's? What how many times? So it, it, oh, so um I can't remember the exact number. It's it but five to ten percent of the Ashkenazi population who develop Parkinson's disease have one of four one of uh, or one variant um that um we know exists in this population. But, but but the variant is very common in our population. You said it's one in 15. Right. But um, for Parkinson's disease, it's, it's, much, it's much elevated over that. Um, That's so, what I'm trying to get a number for. Yeah, I'm not sure. I have to look it up. But, right. but it is... I, I do want to say one more thing, though, is that it's being very aggressively marketed to test for it because there's medication for it now. Right, right. There's always been, you know, it, it, it was the first... Um, it was the first lysosomal storage disease in which um, enzyme replacement therapy was available. And uh, for this disease, which is, again, pretty common in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, I think it's about one in 800 children, um, uh, we, we can give enzyme replacement therapy to replace the enzyme that doesn't work. We can, there are other, there's another treatment called substrate reduction therapy where we decrease the amount of the uh, protein that's that needs to be broken down by this enzyme um, so that there's not as much circulating and and the problem with the disease is that this substrate is um, stored because it's not being broken down is stored in cells around the body the advantage the reason that we can do enzyme replacement therapy in this disorder and can't in, say, Tay-Sachs disease, is because in Gaucher, it's, it doesn't affect the central nervous system. So in other words, it doesn't cause the kind of neurologic damage that, is, uh, that occurs in something like sickle in Tay-Sachs disease. Um, so in Gaucher, um, the enzyme works in the peripheral circulation, but can get into across the blood brain barrier into the brain. So as a result, it doesn't cause, uh, it, it doesn't have any effects on the central nervous system. 
uh, but it can take care of the problem in the peripheral body. And that's where most of the manifestations of this disease exist. So far, there hasn't been any real success in getting enzyme across the blood-brain barrier mm. to treat things like Tay-Sachs disease and other disorders that are caused by enzyme deficiencies like the mucopolysaccharidoses. So mucopolysaccharidoses is a whole other class of disorders uh, in which there's storage of uh, substances called mucopolysaccharides. Some of those, um, the more common ones, Hunter syndrome and Hurler syndrome, have a central nervous system component. Some of them don't have a central nervous system component. That's, there are two of them, Morchio syndrome and Marital Lame syndrome. Um, in, in Marital Lame and Morchio syndrome, we can do enzyme replacement therapy because they don't have effects of the central no. nervous system. So it takes care of the, uh, reducing the, the uh, substrate in the rest of their body. But in Hunter syndrome and Hurler syndrome, we can't stop the degeneration of the central nervous system that occurs because we can't get the enzyme across the blood-brain barrier. I have a question though. If, this, if Gaucher's disease is very wide in variability, yes. right? And some people yes. have real impairments and that enzyme therapy is, is life-saving, right? Yes. But what about yep. if you're picking it up asymptomatically? Are you going to give them enzyme therapy for life, even if they may not have had much symptoms? Uh, no, probably not. And a good thing is that, so there are different, in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, 90% of the gene changes that we see um, are of four types. So there are four variants that occur in, I think, like, 90% or 70% of all patients with this condition. Um, and we can look at those, what, what those, what changes that an individual person has in the gene and, and predict what his or her severity is going mm. to be. So in other words, if somebody has um, two copies of the same variant, we can look at the literature and say, oh, this person's likelihood is that they will reach the age of 50 and not have any symptoms. And from 50 to 70, they'll start having some bone changes mm. that will lead to like arthritis. But this other person who has one copy of this variant and another copy of another variant, both of which are very common, will have symptoms much earlier. And that person will need to have enzyme replacement therapy from early in life. So it, it's we're guided by the genes, by the change in the genes, but we're also guided by that individual person's um, uh, phenotype. So mm -hmm. how severe the disease is in that person. Um, and, you know, um, I, I have a, a patient who I recently saw who um, started having bone problems at the age of 20 when she was in college and got started on enzyme replacement, and that's when she was diagnosed with Gaucher, and got started on enzyme replacement therapy right then, um, when she was 20 years old, and has been on it now for 15 years. Um, so, and, and improved dramatically, her, her clinical condition is much better now than it was um, when she was first diagnosed. Uh, so that's, we're guided by the symptoms that are present, but also we can kind of predict what, they're going to, what their lives are going to be like based on the changes in the genes. Do you think that this should be tested for in every body at risk? It's not part of the newborn screen. It's not part of the newborn screen at this point. <clears throat> and, you know, it's one of those questions that you need to, that needs to be raised and discussed. And also, you know, it's very, um, it's very controversial about whether to do newborn uh, to do prenatal testing for it, with the idea of terminating a pregnancy. Mm. Um, you know, what would you do if, if you know that somebody is going to live a completely healthy life, um, not really be affected with this, uh, with any of the symptoms of this disease, um, uh, you know, later on or until they're very old? Um, is that you know, should we be giving people the opportunity to, to make a decision about whether or not to terminate a pregnancy? Um, 
very, very complicated ethical uh, dilemma. Um, I think at the present time, there isn't um, testing for it uh, because of, of that issue, mm -hmm. um, because we don't really know what the, what the future will hold. Uh, for that, for each individual person. But, um, you know, should we be ho withholding that information uh, from somebody just because we have a concern? It's their life, it's their decision to make. You can terminate a pregnancy, at least for now, um, for any reason. Um, you know, why not give people all the uh, um, opportunity in the world. Right. I'm thinking of two different types of screening, right? Two different types of genetic testing. I'm thinking of, of prenatal testing, like the non-invasive prenatal testing, but I'm also thinking of testing of the parents before having a baby. Right, right, right. So, um, uh, you know, should we be testing Ashken Ashkenazi Jewish um, adolescents for Gaucher disease with the idea of not allowing um, marriages between people who are both carriers of Gaucher. Right. I'm going to interrupt you for just a second saying I think you're talking about Dora Yasharim because Dora yeah. Yasharim is, is genetic testing where they do not tell you, right. as opposed to there's J-screen where they do tell you, and right. then there's actually J-padable, which is in between. Right, right. So, so um, you know, should this information be available, are we gonna are we gonna tell families not to not to have children because of uh, you know it's it's a complicated issue. But, I don't but, know. but 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 it's common. You'd be you'd be you know yeah. mixing a lot of matches that way, and it's treatable. Yeah. I, I don't I won't I don't understand why anybody would do that. Yeah, but I no, understand the dilemma of telling them also, especially with the Parkinson's. Right. So, so I agree, and I think that's why a lot of the programs do not test for Gaucher, uh, for this reason. But sh if a if a family is interested in knowing this, should they be tested? Um, should they be tested? I guess is the way I would put it. So, uh, you know, it's a it's a it's it's still a dilemma. Um, as it is for other genetic diseases that are actionable only in older adulthood. Um, so, you know, should we be testing for diseases prenatally for diseases like, or postnatally for diseases like um, Huntington's disease, mm -hmm. um, as an example, uh, where you know, you have probably 30 to 35 years of happy, healthy life. And then you start to develop a neurodegenerative condition that leads to your death within 15 years or so um, in, the, in the typical case of, um, of Huntington's disease. Um, is, you know, when should you be testing for that? Should you you know, um, the situation that, that often comes up is a parent who's 35 or 36 years old starts having symptoms, has a family history of Huntington's disease, gets tested, and has found that he or she um, is positive for, the for a change in the gene that causes Huntington's disease. Uh, but they have a four-year-old or a five-year-old child. Um, should that child be tested? or not. And, you know, I think all of us in genetics have a very strong feeling about that. Mm -hmm. um, and that it's not, mm -hmm. they shouldn't be tested because uh, this is genetic information that is owned by the child, basically. And the child should be able to make that decision when he or she gets to a point where it becomes important in his or her life. So in other words, there's nothing we can do if the kid at this point in time, anyway, it's not like there's a treatment available uh, that will prevent the child if he or she carries this variant uh, from, um, from developing symptoms. So there's no point in the child knowing about it now. Um, and when 
he or she is at a point where he or she needs to know about this, uh, that is probably when the child is, a, is going to have children of his or her own and wants to know what the risk to his children are, um, then that person can make the decision him or herself um, rather, sure. than, uh, rather than forcing it on a four-year-old or a five-year-old who has no say in the matter and, and may, it may alter his or her life completely. Right. The only thing I'm going to say, though, is that everything is changing so fast. We are coming out with genetic cures, these miracles. And if that changes, then that would change the equation, obviously. That's exactly right. That's the other side of this is mm. that, well, if we have a treatment for this, who are, who's going to be treated? It's going to be the people who have been identified. Mm. Uh, but we can if that if we come to that, we can always do that testing. Um, right. I want to give one more example of the BRCA mutation, because I can say as a pediatrician, okay. I've had mothers who have the BRCA mutation and they want to test their kids. Right. And I have to tell them, no, they're under 18. I'm not right. going to do that. Right. Again, it's the child's decision to make. And the reason that it's important is that there's not it's not going to change anything in the child's life. Right. Um, it's you know, there's no treatment that's going to occur. There's no screening that's going to occur in a child who's under 10. Uh, whose whose mother has a BRCA one or two mutation, uh, so there's there's really no need for that that person to know, and it really is something that that person should decide to do. There are also all other all sorts of other issues that come up, like um, you know I have a, a child who has um, who's who uh, I, I have Huntington's disease. I have a child who's at risk. Um, I have three children who are at risk. Um, it turns out that one of them is affected. Two of them uh, are, one of them carries the change in the gene. Two of them don't. I have enough money for college for two kids. Who am I going to send? So it's those are the decisions that you need to worry about because it, I, I liken it to opening Pandora's box. Right. Once you open the box, you can't close it again. You right. know, the, yeah. Right. So speaking of Pandora's box, I'm sorry, but <laughs> we're almost uh, we're going to almost be done. Uh, we have to be. Um, yeah, we could talk all day. We could talk all I day. <laughs> I just want to talk for a few minutes about direct to consumer testing because when you talk about opening a Pandora box, and you know, you mentioned earlier that this is what how the geneticists make you know their living <laughs> by interpreting these tests, and there's also right. genetic counselors, by the way. Right. Yes. So uh, genetic counselors are, and I'm sure probably most people know this, genetic counselors are uh, master's level uh, professionals who um, get training in genetics and in, um, and in counseling, basically, in, uh, in aspects of, of dealing with families and who work with geneticists for the most part, but not always, in interpreting lab results and providing information and counseling to families that um, have had genetic testing. So there ha have been a lot of genetic counselors who have worked for direct to consumer uh, genetic testing companies um, in trying to help interpret some of the tests, but they're not part of the usual process uh, that occurs in in direct to consumer marketing. Right, can you explain a little bit about what, I, what we're talking about? What is direct to consumer? And, and I just wanna point out though, that there is an intermediate version where you, you're doing the testing on your own, but you get to have a professional interpret it. Right, so going back to an earlier part of our discussion, we talked about the fact that in the old days, um, uh, you would, uh, you know, a, a family would see a geneticist, the geneticist would, would try to put together the pieces of the puzzle and do genetic testing for that condition. As time has passed, um, we kind of have turned that on its head. We do genetic testing and try to, uh, and based on the results, try to interpret what's found and interpret that for the family and talk about what the next steps will be. Um, this is especially important with uh, VUZ's uh, variants of uncertain significance, where it's not clear whether these are disease causing or not. So in this case, it's the geneticist and the family decide what testing they would, 
that should be done. The family agrees to doing that test. We counsel the family about what the results of the test might be to prepare them for getting those results. We do the test and then interpret the results of the test for the family and counsel them about next steps. Um, with direct-to-consumer marketing, what happens is you get a test done, you decide that you want to get the test done, um, you send uh, um, some spit in a tube to the lab, they do some testing and report it back to you, but they don't interpret it for you. So you're, as, as a consumer, you're without significant without you know knowledge of genetics you're getting this report back and not necessarily knowing what the results mean and that could be very serious and it could be kind of damaging because you can get information that's wrong you can get information that is that needs to be further evaluated um, you can get information that you think means that you're not at risk for a specific problem, but actually you are at risk for a specific problem. Um, and you have no place to really turn to ask the questions that you need to ask. So that's also the information is out there once you've sent the lab your information so they can use the information, the genetic information in any way that they want. Whoa. So we're talking yeah. 23andMe, for example, right? Yes. Yes. So, wow. so in most cases, that information is out there. You don't own it. I mean, you don't own it the way you did before you had the testing done. So I'm very leery of direct-to-consumer mm -hmm. genetic testing for the most part. And um, I think that the information that you can get from direct-to-consumer testing is I, I think you're better off in um, during a Seder or during Thanksgiving dinner when your entire family is sitting around the table, just doing a family tree mm. and figuring out what kinds of conditions you're at risk for in your family. So, you know, in other words, if you have three grandparents who have all had coronary artery disease, it doesn't take a genetic test from a direct-to-consumer uh, lab to tell you that you're probably at risk for coronary artery disease and you need to do something to protect yourself. Um, you can get as much information from just taking a, a complete family tree of three or four generations, if you can get that many, um, as you probably more than you can get from direct-to-consumer uh, testing. And I'll just tell, I don't know if we have time for this, but- Wait, I want to um, say something before I forget. One second, sure. you're giving me a moment to get my word in, it drives <laughs> You're sure. fantastic. Um, I'm thinking that not only can more be less, you can be getting too much information you don't know what to do with, but you can actually get too little information. I just want to tell a quick story. I heard a podcast about a couple that had prenatal testing. You know, they both were tested beforehand and they had a try with Tay-Sachs because the mother had the Ashkenazic mutation, but not everybody realizes that there were non-Ashkenazic mutations for Tay-Sachs, which is what the father had. And it was really, yes. it was a sad, a sad story. So you really need to have good, you know, genetic counseling. <laughs> yes. Um, and I saw a family yesterday um, at Rare Disease Day, um, uh, two sisters who had a rare form of Tay-Sachs disease, adult onset Tay-Sachs disease, who are not Jewish, and because again, it's a non-Ashkenazi uh, mutation, and they were not picked up for years and years, even though they were having symptoms, because the, everybody who was who was taking care of them said, "Well, you're not Jewish, so you can't possibly have to sex. We're not going to test you for this." And it was only when they had whole exome sequencing, because they they couldn't find a diagnosis that they were found to have changes in the hex A gene right. that was responsible for it. But I just wanted to tell the story about my mother-in-law who I'm going to visit in a little while. My mother-in-law is 96 years old. Um, and she, <laughs> she should she, live to be well to 120, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and she's a, thank you. And she's in excellent health. She takes no prescription medications. Um, 
about five years ago, she was um, she had bronchitis in the winter and went to her um, physician who prescribed an antibiotic and she took the antibiotic, did some blood work, did a chest x-ray. Um, and she came back for a checkup two weeks later. Um, she was completely recovered, but um, the apparently the the physician um, had sent off testing for um, for risk for coronary artery disease um, uh, using uh, genetic um, polymorphisms, and the result came back that she was at high risk for coronary artery disease. So he wanted to start her on medication for um, her coronary artery disease, uh, which she didn't have. She was 92 years old at the time. She had never had any heart disease. So this information is not, ac not always accurate. It's kind of like um, a prediction of what might happen, but you have to use clinical judgment. Right. And again, if you don't have the background to understand what these polymorphisms mean, you you uh, you're going to make terrible mistakes, and lots of money are go is going to be wasted, and um, and bad medicine is going to be practiced. So um, again, it's it's really important to have a good understanding of what the results mean, and even more importantly, what the results don't necessarily. Right. Right. That's a fantastic explanation. And we could talk all day. And I already told you beforehand that I'm going to link in the show notes um, other talks so that parts we didn't cover will be covered. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for doing this with me today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. But I think I need a nap now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired too. It's so much information, but it is so valuable. Now you can go visit your mom. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Thank so, you thanks. so much. Be well. Thank you. Same to you. Be well. You thanks for listening to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast. If you've enjoyed this, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share this with your friends. For more information, check out our Instagram at joma underscore org. Check out our website, www.joma.org, that's J-O-W-M-A dot org, or email us at health at joma.org.